Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I did want to remind you that anytime you'd like, you can go to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net and order your Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt or pullover, which is definitely really nice as we're getting into fall. Go to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net to place your order today. All right, it's time now for today's episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. The original air date, January the 19th of 1950, and this is the Bride and Groom murder case. Time now for Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now for Mr. Keen and the Bride and Groom murder case. Our scene opens in a roof garden restaurant which is located atop a 14-story building in mid-Manhattan. The dance floor is crowded with gay people, while at a small table in the corner, a young man and his lovely young bride gaze out of the large window at the breathtaking skyline which is New York after dark, a skyline that is soon destined to become a backdrop for horror. Oh, what a fascinating restaurant this is, Roy. It's one of the most popular in New York, Olivia. Just look at that view through the window. And then there's a terrace that goes around the roof. It isn't very cold this evening. Would you like to go out and see what New York looks like at night? Oh, I'd love to, darling. Okay, let's go. Up this door. Oh, Roy. What a heavenly view. Yeah, this roof garden restaurant is on the 14th floor. You can see most of Manhattan from here. There's Central Park. And Broadway's over there. See the lights? Mm-hmm. You're happy, darling? I'm very happy, Roy. This is one honeymoon that's going to last forever. Oh, great Scott, I forgot to phone my mother. You must you do it now? Oh, you know her mother is, Olivia. I'd better give her a ring at her hotel. Will you wait here on the terrace for me? I won't be long. All right, Roy. I'll make the conversation a short one. Oh, I never dreamed the city could look so romantic at night. Roy? Is that you? What? What are you doing? What's the matter with you? No! I returned to the terrace, Mr. King. There was a crowd there. That's when I learned that Olivia, my bride, had been pushed off the roof to her death on the street below. Were there any witnesses, Roy? Well, if someone had seen the killer, I, I wouldn't have come to you, Mr. King. The case would be an easy one for the police to solve. But if there were no witnesses, young fellow, how do you know it was murder? Olivia would never have killed herself. My partner, my Clancy, didn't mean it that way, Roy. Maybe she slipped or lost her balance. Well, that couldn't have happened. The railing around the terrace was several feet high. Besides, the police are almost certain it was murder. Why, Roy? Well, there was a slight drizzle in the air last night, Mr. Keene, and there were footprints near the spot where Olivia was standing. The police deduced from the footprints that Olivia must have struggled before she was pushed over the rail. I see. We'd only been married a week, Mr. Keene. We'd come to New York on our honeymoon. Olivia was the most wonderful girl I've ever known. You mustn't let this tragedy ruin your own life, Roy. You're young. You've got to learn to live with your sorrow. It would make it a great deal easier, Mr. Keene, if I could get my hands on whoever killed my wife. That job will be mine and Mike Clancy's. Now tell me, do you or your wife have any friends or relatives in New York? Olivia's half-brother lives here with his wife. Those are the only people we know in New York. My home is in Cleveland, Mr. Keene. Have you seen your wife's half-brother recently? Yes, he invited Olivia and me to dinner the night before last. We only arrived in New York on Monday. 
While you were telling me the story just now, you said you left your bride on the terrace and went to telephone your mother. Does she live in New York? No, but she arrived here yesterday. Mother's a buyer for a department store, and my father is dead. Mother's semi-annual buying trip to New York happened to coincide with our honeymoon. I suppose the news of your wife's death shocked her. Oh, Mother was terribly shocked, Mr. Keene. I... I've been worrying about her, too. You, you see, she just got out of a hospital. Oh? What was wrong with her, Roy? She was run down and needed a rest. But she recovered quickly and went back to her job. I see. Or is there anything else you might be able to tell us? For instance, did your wife have any enemies that you know of? No, Mr. Keene. I, I can't imagine who would want to harm her. All I ask is that you put this killer, whoever he is, behind bars. We'll do our utmost, Roy. Where are you staying? At the Hotel Barrage. Mother's staying there, too. And your brother-in-law? Where does he live? Elliot Warwick and his wife live at 975 East 60th. Take that down, will you, Mike? Right, boss. We'll get in touch with you very soon, Roy. Very well, Mr. Keene. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Clancy. So long, young fellow. Goodbye, Roy. Oh, sure, it must be a terrible blow to lose a wife, Mr. Keene. And on a honeymoon, too. Yes, Roy Farman's a very unhappy young man right now, Mike. I'll take it. Hello? Is this Mr. Keene? Yes. My name is Elliot Warwick. My half-sister was murdered last night. She was pushed off a roof. It hasn't been reported in the papers yet. I'm familiar with the tragedy, Mr. Warwick. You are? Your brother-in-law just left my office. Roy Farnham, what did he want? He asked me to investigate the case on his behalf. He would. How do you mean, Mr. Warwick? Did he tell you his wife, my half-sister, was an heiress? And did he say that he only holds down a $60 a week job? What would that have to do with his wife's murder? Roy Farnham inherits one million dollars from Olivia. I called you myself, Mr. Keene, to ask you to investigate the case. If you could come over to my house now, I'll give you a few facts that might surprise you. In that case, Mr. Warwick, I'll lose no time in getting over there. I have your address. Roy Farnham gave it to me. I'll be waiting for you. Goodbye, Mr. Keene. Goodbye. What's up, boss? Mike, that was Olivia Farnham's half-brother, Elliot Warwick. He implied that Roy Farnham himself might have killed his wife for her money. Saints preserve us. Roy didn't look like that kind of a lad. Well, we're certainly going to investigate. At the same time, it'll give us an opportunity to see how Elliot Warwick and his wife fit into this case. Come in, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Oh, thank you, Mr. Warwick. Jane! What is it, Elliot? Mr. Keene and his partner are here. I hope we're not disturbing your wife, Mr. Warwick. Well, she's been feeling irritable and out of sorts lately, but it's nothing serious. Uh, Jane, this is Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, the famous investigators. How do you do? How do you do? Pleased to meet you, ma'am. You know why they're here, Jane. Yes, Elliot. To investigate your sister Olivia's death. Well, I'm going to put my cards on the table, Mr. Keene, and you can take it any way you wish. I didn't like my husband's sister. And her death doesn't break my heart. How can you talk that way, Jane? Elliot, I'm no hypocrite. Olivia and I meant nothing to each other, and I'm willing to admit it. You're all very frank, Mrs. Warwick. Mr. Keene, you'd have found that out yourself in any case. And I refuse to put myself in an embarrassing position. To say nothing of a suspicious one? If you're suggesting that I'm a murderer, Mr. Clancy, why don't you put me under arrest? Now, just a moment, Mrs. Warwick. You're not under suspicion. My partner and I only want your cooperation, nothing more. Sure, and maybe I talked a bit out of turn, Mrs. Warwick. I'm sorry. That's quite all right, Mr. Clancy. I don't believe I can help you, Mr. Keene. Perhaps Elliot can. If you don't mind now, I'd prefer to rest for a while. I have a splitting headache. Go right ahead, Mrs. Warwick. I'll lie down inside, Elliot. All right, dear. Your wife's face looks familiar, Mr. Warwick. You may have seen her on the screen, Mr. Keene. She was a featured player in Hollywood before we married. Oh, she's given up her screen career? For my sake. Well, Mr. Warwick, if you don't mind, I'd like a more thorough explanation of what you suggested over the telephone. You said that Roy Farnham inherits a large fortune from his murdered wife, Olivia? Yes, Mr. Keene. Olivia married Roy only a few days before she was thrown off that roof and killed. Automatically, he becomes the heir to her estate, which is valued at over a million. A million dollar estate? Yes, Mr. Clancy. To make myself clear, I'm accusing Roy of having murdered my half-sister for her money. You have any proof, Mr. Warwick? Proof? What more do you need than that, Mr. Keene? He was with Olivia on that terrace at the Roof Garden restaurant, wasn't he? 
That doesn't mean he pushed her to her death. Well, I'm just telling you what I know. The girl has an estate worth a million dollars. Mr. Warwick, did you share in that estate as Olivia's half-brother? Why, no. It was left to Olivia by her father, who was my stepfather. We didn't get along. I moved from Cleveland to New York several years ago and lost touch with the family. Your accusation is a grave one, Mr. Warwick. And in order to be fair to Roy Farnham, I think I must tell him about it. I'm not afraid of him. All right. You intend to leave this house today? No. Then I'll phone you later. I may want to speak to you again in Roy's presence. Come along, Mike. Uh, please say goodbye to your wife for us, Mr. Warwick. For just a moment, Mr. Keene. Yes? <sighs> Nothing. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Goodbye, Mr. Warwick. Goodbye. So long, mister. Oh, Mike, you've got something to work on at any rate. Hey, boss, do you think that this fellow Warwick knew what he was talking about? Accusing Roy Farnham of murdering his own wife? We'll soon find out when we speak to Roy Farnham once more. Let's go over to his hotel right now. Mr. Keene, Mr. Clancy. I'm getting in touch with you sooner than I expected, Roy. Oh, come in. My mother is here with me. Who is it, Roy? Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, mother. Mr. Keene? The great investigator. I told you I'd gone to consult him about Olivia's death. I'm very glad to know you, Mr. Keene, and you, Mr. Clancy. Pleased to meet you. How do you do, Mrs. Varnum? My reason for coming here isn't a very happy one. And I was hoping I'd be able to speak to your son, Roy, alone. What is it, Mr. Keene? Do you have any news concerning Olivia's murder? Perhaps. You can say what you like in front of me, Mr. Keene. My son, Roy, and I have never had any secrets from each other. In that case, I'll be frank. Roy, you've been accused of your wife's murder. That's insane. Who accused me, Mr. King? Your brother-in-law, Elliot Warwick. Oh, naturally. Mr. King, he hates my son. Does he, Mrs. Farnham? Why? Because of Olivia's money. He knows my boy will inherit it now that she's gone. Mother, let's not talk about that now, please. Why not, Roy? We want to be honest with Mr. King, don't we? I'm hoping you will be, Mrs. Farnham. But Mr. King, Elliot Warwick was in the process of suing his sister Olivia when she married Roy. For part of her estate? Yes. He wanted to have his stepfather's will declared invalid, but he didn't get very far. However, now that his half-sister Olivia is dead, I'm sure he thinks he's got a better chance to share in her money. I'd say he has a very good chance, Mrs. Farnham, but at the same time, he's going to try to make trouble for your son, Roy. Oh, no. No, he can't do that. My son's innocent, and he loved that girl. He he even loved him more than he... Oh, mother. I... I feel faint. Passing out. I've got her. Mother, what's the matter? Mother! I'll carry her inside, Mr. Keene. Would you please call the house physician? I will, Roy. Mr. Keene, wait a minute. Look at this. What is it, Mike? This drawer near the telephone's half open. Look what's inside. It's a revolver. And a big one. Now, what would a young fellow like Roy Farnham be doing with a gun like this? That's just one of the questions we're going to find an answer for, Mike. After the doctor treats his mother. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the death of pretty Olivia Farnham, a bride of less than a week, who was pushed from the terrace of a restaurant located 14 stories above the ground. At the moment, Mr. Keene and Mike are in the hotel suite occupied by the victim's husband, Roy, whose mother has just had a sudden fainting spell on hearing that her son may be implicated in the crime. A doctor has arrived, and after treating Mrs. Farnham, has left. Now in the living room of Roy Farnham's hotel suite. Has the doctor gone, Mr. Keene? Yes, Roy. I was afraid Mother had a heart attack, but I guess it was nothing serious. She seems to be much better. She should be, young fella. There's nothing like a phony thing to get a chance to take things easy. I beg your pardon? What my partner, Mike Clancy, refers to, Roy, is what the doctor just told us. Your mother didn't think. She only pretended to. But that's fantastic. Mother was upset, Mr. Keene, because you were putting me under suspicion of having killed my wife. Suppose we question her about that now. There's no need for that, Mr. Keene. Mother. The doctor was right. 
But why? Why did you do it, Mother? I think I can answer that, Roy, with your mother's permission. By the way she behaves, I'd say she was very attached to you. My son means more to me than anything else in the world, Mr. Keene. I... I only made believe I was ill to gain time for him to answer those terrible accusations. Miss Farnham, was your last sergeant in the hospital another method of gaining time? What do you mean? Your son Roy told me you were ill and had to go to the hospital just before he was married. What hospital were you in, may I ask? The Central in Cleveland. Mike, would you get them on the long-distance phone? Right away, boss. Just a moment, Mr. Keene. Why do you want to call the hospital? To inquire about the nature of your illness. No. But, Mother, there's nothing to be worried about. Or is there, Mrs. Farnham? Mr. Keene, I... I only pretended to be ill. I was trying to stop my son Roy's marriage to Olivia. Mother, you don't mean it. I left the hospital, Roy, and followed you and Olivia to New York. Mrs. Farnham, you mean you were so angry with your son for having married... You came here to try and separate him and his bride? Yes, yes. Though he is my son, he belongs to me. Oh, go on, arrest me, Mr. Keene. I was at that roof garden when Olivia was murdered. Arrest me for the crime. Mother! You phoned me at the hotel, didn't you, Roy? And you got no answers. Well, I followed you. I'd heard you mention at that dinner party that you intended to go to the roof garden last night, and I went there, too. What dinner party are you referring to, Mrs. Farnham? The one the Warwicks gave? Yes, Mr. Keene. And if his half-brother invited me, too. Well, what are you waiting for? I'm confessing to Olivia's murder. Why don't you turn me over to the police? Because I don't believe you. You don't? Perhaps you were at the restaurant when your daughter-in-law was killed. But you'd have never murdered her yourself. Why do you say that, Mr. Keene? Because suspicion for the crime would have fallen on your son. And I'm sure you'll do nothing to get him into trouble. No, Mrs. Farnham. You're only trying to protect him now. And I want to know why. Mother, why are you trying to protect me this way? Be quiet, son. Mrs. Farnham, unless you tell me the truth, I'll have to put your son under arrest for the crime. Because that idiot Elliot Warwick accused him of killing Olivia for her inheritance? And also because of the gun we found just now in that drawer. Show it to the mic. It's as big as a cannon, mister. Is that gun yours, Roy? Yes, Mother, it is. But I have a license for it, Mr. Keene. I've carried it for months. For my own protection. Has anyone threatened you? I've, I've had a hunch that trouble was in store for me. And hunches don't count in the court of law, Roy. A jury might think you carried this gun to use on your wife in the event another means of killing her had failed. Oh, no. No, don't say that. Mrs. Farnham, I'm willing to help your son, Roy, if he is innocent. But you're hiding something from me, and I've got to know the facts. Tell Mr. Keene everything, Mother. I have nothing to be afraid of. Very well. Mr. Keene, the part about my being in the restaurant was the truth. Some insanely jealous reaction made me follow my son around wherever he went with his wife. Go on, Mrs. Barnum. I saw him go out on the terrace with Olivia. Then I heard a scream. I rushed around to the back of the terrace. Olivia had fallen to the street. Do you see anyone else there on the terrace? No, Mr. Keene, but I found something. What was it you found? It's in my handbag. I'll get it. Mr. Keene, my mother didn't see me there on the terrace because I was inside making my phone call to her. Yes, I remember you told me that, Roy. She had complained of not feeling well and I had promised to phone. Mr. Keene, I'm trusting you with my son's life and I'll show you this. Here. Uh, it's a ring, boss. Yes, Mike, a man's gold ring. It has my daughter-in-law and Lydia's family crest on it. I knew she'd given it to Roy. I found it... I found it on the spot where Olivia must have been standing before she was thrown from the roof. Is this ring yours, Roy? Oh, it looks like mine, Mr. King. And your wife gave it to you? Well, there were two rings like that in her family. One was Olivia's and the other was her half-brother Elliot's. Olivia had hers made larger and gave it to me to wear. But I... I can't imagine how that ring got into the restaurant. I I lost mine two weeks ago. We didn't, Roy. Maybe that ring is Elliot Warwick. Sure, that excuse is a thin one if you ask me, boss. Roy could have lost that ring, all right, when he pushed his wife over the roof and she put up a struggle. That's not true, Mr. Clancy. Let me see your hand, Roy. Hmm. There's one thing I will say. This ring will lead me to Olivia Farnham's murderer. Roy, he doesn't believe it. 
Mr. Keene doesn't believe us. You, Mr. Keene, Mr. Clancy. Good evening, Mr. Warwick. Well, did you accuse Roy Farnham of murdering my half-sister? Yes, I told him you had accused him, and he in turn accused you. He accused me? <laughs> What's he trying to do, cover for himself? Mr. Warwick, I understand you were suing your sister to break your stepfather's will. Why, well, yes, but that's ancient history. I made up with Olivia long ago. Because you realized your lawsuit wasn't strong enough? I don't see... However, now that she's dead... I imagine you'll bring suit again, this time against her husband, Roy Farnham, claiming a share of Olivia's estate. I have more of a right to that money than he has. Tell me something, Mr. Warren. Did Olivia leave any life insurance? Not very much. Just how much? $50,000. Not much, did you say? $50,000. And who is the beneficiary? He is, Mr. Keene. Jane. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Warwick. Elliot, you may as well admit the truth to Mr. Keene. You're finished in this murder case. How can you talk like that, Jane, about me? Your husband, the man you love. The man I love. Ha! Don't make me laugh. I married you, Elliot, because you filled me full of lies. Lies about your inheriting half a million dollars. But it was your half-sister, Olivia, who inherited the money. And you knew she would all the time. Is that true, Elliot? Oh, Mr. Keene, I... I was madly in love with Jane, and I had to make her my wife. Yes, at the cost of my Hollywood career. I quit pictures because of your promises, Elliot. And all I got were lies. Go on, Mr. Keene. Put him under arrest. He killed his sister because she made him her insurance beneficiary. She felt sorry for him because he was too stupid to hold a good job. But Jane, Jane, don't say that. She left him $50,000 in insurance money. I'd say that insurance was definitely one of the motives for murder, Mrs. Warwick. Then why don't you arrest Elliot, Mr. Keene? He wasn't even home the night his half-sister was murdered. And where were you, Mrs. Warwick? I was at home. Can anyone else prove that besides yourself? Why do I have to prove it? Because I had some very interesting evidence in regard to Olivia Farnham's murderer. Mr. Warwick, uh, do you recognize this ring? I believe it has your family crest on it. Why, it looks like the ring I gave to Jane. It's a lie. Well, don't you remember, Jane? Olivia had a ring like that, and so did I. There was a family tradition about those rings. We were each supposed to give them to our future marriage partners when we were engaged. Then, then Roy Farnham had one too, Mr. King. Yes, given to him by his wife. However, this is not the ring he received. How do you know? It's much too small for a man's finger. Uh, Mr. Warwick, let me see your finger. That ring doesn't fit any of my fingers, Mr. Keene. But I'll wager it fits your wife. Don't touch me. Now take it easy, lady. Mr. Keene, are you saying that Jane, that my wife... I'm saying that your wife murdered your sister for the same reason she tried to blame the murder on you. Money. She evidently married you, thinking you were heir to a fortune then tried to make you one by killing your sister. Not only would you and she have gained Olivia's insurance, but the possibility of sharing her estate as well. Don't come near me, any of you. This ring came off your wife's hand when Olivia struggled for her life to keep from being pushed off the roof garden. No, no. You were very clever, Mrs. Warwick. When I first met you, you used a sly psychology. You thought if you candidly admitted disliking your sister-in-law and casting a slight suspicion on yourself... You disarm the authorities and me. Most murderers do everything they can to hide that guilt. Jane, I can't believe it of you. Your wife was worried when I returned here tonight, Mr. Warwick. And to save herself, she tried to pin the murder on you. All right, Mike. You can put the handcuffs on Jane Warwick. Right, boss. You'll never be able to take me to prison. Do you understand? Boss, look out. She's picked up a fire poker. <laughs> Who's great of me, aren't you? Well, why don't you come and get me? <laughs> Mr. Kane, she fell through the window. It's nine stories to the ground. I'm sure that's justice for you. Yes, Mike. Jane Warwick met the same fate she dealt her victim. We'd better go down there to the street. Meanwhile, I'll call police headquarters and tell them we found a lit of your Farnham's murderer and the case is closed. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the bride and groom murder case. Mr. 
18, Tracer of Lost Persons, has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, if the murderess had simply removed her uh, jewelry... There's no way Keen would have caught her. Uh, This one is kind of a weak clue, but I think there was a pretty good buildup. So overall, it does work good. I do wonder why calling it the bride and groom uh, murder case if the groom wasn't uh, murdered. At any rate, though, we'll turn now to listener comments and feedback. Uh, Rebecca writes, Thanks, Adam, for the great podcast. These old-time radio programs are so fun to listen to. I really like Rocky Jordan, but the variety you have on is so great. Uh, Don't you think it's a little silly how every time on Mr. Keene, when someone meets him, they say, You mean Mr. Keene, the famous detective? Ah, yes, we established that yet again. Thanks again for the great show. Well, I, I do think that Mr. Keene is kind of, at least in his uh, world, in the same sort of situation of being a celebrity detective as is uh, Nick Carter or Sherlock Holmes. And to an extent, that happens to Johnny Dollar with people recognizing uh, him due to the radio show. Uh, you know, at least in terms of knowing who he is. I think that it is a bit overdone, though, on uh, Mr. Keene, and I don't know why they do that every single episode. Uh, Because they do tend to repeat things like names, and, you know, maybe that's convenient for the convenience of the people listening, thinking, you know, particularly, what's the name of that character? But we, but I have no idea what the justification for uh, constantly reiterating Mr. Keene's uh, role. Because on Johnny Dollar, for example, it establishes whether a character actually is aware of Johnny Dollar. But everybody is aware of Mr. Keene, and you're kind of like, okay, let's just go ahead and stipulate that every person in New York City knows who Mr. Keene is. But for whatever reason, that's not the approach they took. But good point, Rebecca. All right, that'll do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for That Strong Guy. And we'll be back next Monday with another episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.